All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is a Washington State Building Code Council, the IBC Technical Advisory Group for March 28th today. How's that sound? 29th. 29th, 29th. 29th. there we go, it's right in front of me. Thank you. Uh, let's start by taking roll, if we can, of the existing TAG members. All righty, so I'll lead off with uh, Todd Bayreuther. Here. Uh, Charles Calvano. Susan Kaufman. Mark Sniffen. Present. Sean Carlstrom. Here. Andrea Smith. Corey Thomas. I'm here. Dave Germer. Bill Mybush. Tom Shaw. I don't think we have a call. Chris Seaman. Alan Spaulding. Present. Michael Barra. Present. Will Rodriguez. Roger Hiringa. I'm here. Adam Phillips. And it appears that we are a few shy of a quorum at the moment. Okay. Thank you, Dustin. So um, with that, we, we won't take any action until we receive quorum, but uh, let's start oh, with- this is uh, Chris. I popped in a little late, so I you probably yeah, passed thank me. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, Chris Sue, Sue Kaufman here too. I just popped in. Okay. With those two, we have quorum. And All I right. also see Will Rodriguez and Miley shown as an ex officio, so you can- uh, you don't you don't count him either. Okay. Yeah, okay. This is Dave Coke on him. I didn't hear my name uh, noticed, but announced. So let me let me clarify something. So here we have the IBC Technical Advisory Group, and we invited the uh, IFC uh, Technical Advisory Group. Uh, for the IFC Technical Advisory Group, we don't need any quorum because uh, we would appreciate the uh, uh, fire code tag members uh, for their opinion and uh, their participation. But after we finish with IBC, uh, there are sections in the fire code as well. So then we will do the other way around. We will invite the fire code tag to uh, discuss the proposals in the fire code and we'll invite the IBC technical advisory group members. Uh, to participate and provide uh, if it if it makes sense. Okay, apologize for the confusion. That's my fault. I, I, I should have clarified that. No, nope. I think that was a useful conversation there. So thank you. Um, okay, but with that, let's continue the introductions then. And, and maybe that's the next step is to introduce the uh, IFC tag members that are joining. Is that a good idea? Yes. Okay. Do, no, do, we, do have, we have do we have a list of the tag members, or do you just want to simply? I do have a list of fire tag members. I can do a roll call for them if you like. Let's do it just just for the sake of understanding who's here, please. All righty. So doing a roll call for fire tag members, we got Tony Doan, Kuyen Tai, Corey Thomas, who is here for our tag. He is here. Mike Six. Ricky Campbell, Ken Brule, here. Dave Cocot, present. Uh, Kevin Marr, Zach Tuck, here. We got Chris Seaman, who is here for our tag as well, and Roger Heringa as well. And that concludes okay. the roll call for fire tag. Appreciate that. Thank you. 
And just as a note for everyone, if, if we go past uh, 1040, then I'm, I'm going to hand the chair over to Roger Haringa, also on the on the council. Um, anyone else like to be recognized from, from the public? Um, this is Ron Wright. I'm the author of the initial proposal. Great. Welcome, Ron. Uh, and, and this is Paul Clark. I'm actually on the fire code tag. Um, uh, as uh, I was as an alternate, but now um, uh, 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 um, a member, I guess. Great. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else? Okay, let's uh, move on to agenda item two, which is to review and approve this, this brief agenda. I can hear a motion to approve, please. Motion to approve the agenda as, as, as noted on the screen. This is Al. Thank you, Al. This is Chris. I'll second it. Okay. Thanks. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Nay. Okay. So approved. And then let's move into uh, item three. And I'll uh, throw it to Stoyan. Are you going to introduce us to what uh, we're doing today, please? He, yes. Thank you. So, what would you like me to put on screen, Stoyan? Yeah. Well, you can put e e either one. Let's let's wait for the screen. Uh, I wanna, uh, you know, provide some brief information, and then uh, the the TAC members will decide which document they want on the screen. Is that gotcha? Okay? So we started discussing this R four uh, provisions in October last year. And uh, uh, if you remember, the council uh, issued a formal opinion related to R4. Uh, the council recommendation was that it's it needs a lot of work because it's a, a complicated uh, topic to discuss and make a decision as an emergency rule. So the, the council recommendation was to establish uh, a technical advisory, uh, to establish a work group to work on a proposal. And... Uh, I've been with coordination with DOH. I had uh, a few uh, discussions slash email correspondence with Ron Wright. And uh, here, here is where we are. We will have the technical advisory group working as a, a work group because uh, most of the candidates for the work group, they were already TAC members. So there wasn't any reason to uh, slow down the process. Uh, Ron Wright submitted a proposal, uh, and uh, I took his proposal and I developed this uh, uh, document that you see on the website with some uh, side comments for the technical advisory group members to take into account. Uh, the Department of Health is the licensing authority for these uh, uh, facilities, so uh, uh, I was uh, coordinating with the Department of Health as well, as I mentioned it before. And uh, for the technical advisory group members, I suggest we show on the screen the document that the council staff developed, which includes uh, our own rights proposals, again, with some uh, side comments. If you want to see uh, Ron's proposals on the screen, let me know or Dustin and Dustin will show it for you to compare or review. Either way works. It depends what you want to see. Uh, Stoyan, can you clarify uh, from my review of the of the of the document that your staff uh, edited and modified? Those those are modifications to, in fact, the proposal I submitted as the base, right? We use your proposal as a base, yes. So all of the content of my proposal is intact in, in your document? To the best of my understanding, yes. I'm not sure if it's intact, but if there are changes to it, you will see a side comment in order to explain why we're proposing this change. Yeah, I, I um, it makes perfect sense. Got it. So let's let's start with our document then, and we'll we'll keep we'll keep Ron's uh, initial uh, proposal uh, ready. Uh, Dustin, do you want to show it, or I can show it?
Okay, great. So you see some very simple background uh, and uh, Al Spalding is here. So if he wants to uh, provide more information, but I, I was trying to keep the background short and uh, invested more time on the proposals and uh, the evaluation of the sections. Also on the on the back of this proposal, you will see all sections in the model code and uh, some Washington amendments that are related to R4 occupancies. So these sections are there because we need to evaluate and 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 potentially propose further changes to these sections or just uh, decide that no further changes are needed and the model code language is is okay for the purposes of uh, Washington uh, code. So again, everything is available for you. You will see our sections that are in the building code related to our form. Uh, Stoyan, can I also offer, as I think I mentioned to you in the in one of the correspondence, that R four is also unique in that the building code states that if something isn't mentioned as a provision related to an R four, uh, the R three code uh, is the default. So it, it's a little odd in, in that that's not an that's an unusual provision in the building code, but in this case that does make things even a little bit more complicated as far as connecting all the dots. This is a good topic for the technical advisory group to discuss. Uh, okay. Staff may share opinions, but we we don't make the decisions here. Dustin, okay. can, you, can you scroll down to get to the... Okay, so you will see you will see in blue, these are the existing commitments. They are currently in the WAC. And uh, with the red color, you will see proposed modifications to existing commitments. And with the blue underline, these are proposed new amendments. So we can start with these proposals and uh, Ron, if you see something that I don't have here, just please let the TAC members know. Uh, I I hope I didn't miss anything, but it's possible. Well, I, I mean, uh, if we jump here, there, there is one minor revision that was made to the first 38.2.6, where uh, my initial proposal um, crossed out uh, uh, the condition two portion of the group by one. But there's been further discussion sidebar between myself and Al Spalding uh, regarding this entire provision where the code is identifying a specific type of facility, either assisted living or RTF being classified as a particular occupancy group. Um, and I don't know if we just jump right into it. The, the issue here was not to preclude these facilities from being classified as R4 and that it's just as easily um, uh, amenable to, to this to, to simply remove the reference to the fact that, that licensed care facilities um, are specifically identified as an occupancy group as an amendment, just to delete it completely. Al, would you like to comment? Al, you're on the sound. Dustin, if you can if you can scroll back to the top a little bit, or I mean, uh, and and maybe not make it so big. So I think um, I'm going to start in here, and uh, I want to before I start, I want to say it's it's a challenge to make a a proposal, but really easy to critique. So I'm <laughs> I'm going to. Uh, uh, I think we have the same vision here, but maybe a different uh, different idea on how to do this. If we were to strike what Ron's talking about in 308.2.6, it wouldn't make any sense whatsoever to keep the, the last listing under 308.2, because that's basically saying if you're an RTF under 246.337, you're group I1. Um, 
that would be not very helpful to the people using this code. So as a friendly amendment, um, and I don't know if you can do this by track, yeah, track changes, I would suggest right off the top, we would want to take the residential treatment facilities, the, the blue that's not underlined under 308.2, the last line, that should probably be struck. Would you agree with that, Ron, as a friendly yeah. amendment? Well, the, the idea was by inclusion, what the purpose of, of leaving that in 308.2 and 310.5 was to allow a facility that was being uh, reviewed to be either, depending upon the usage or uh, size of the facility, to be either the facility, either an I-1 or an R-4. So if you had, for instance, a facility that had that was licensed for 24 beds, that would be an I-1, uh, would be precluded from being an R-4. So it still would be one of the types of facilities that's included as a facility that's, in, that's under I-1. And it's the same vision when you go down and you have a facility for eight individuals, that would be a facility that would be included under R4. So the intent was to use the same language for both 308.2 and 310.5 to allow for the differences, to allow for the, the basically the size of the facility to place it either in the I or the R, R category. Okay, I, I definitely understand where you come from with that. One of the one of the issues that we've had in the state of Washington is we've had a one size fits all, right? And if we continue down this route, we're going to have a two size fits all. And really, what I'm hoping to do by adopting the R four and eliminating some of the specific uh, amendments that are currently on the books is to allow us to use the entire building code to decide. And let me give you some examples of that. We have uh, the RT, the licensed RTFs licensed by the Department of Health have evolved so much uh, over the last probably 10 years, I'd say. I mean, we have competency restoration uh, that is uh, services that are being provided as an RTF. Those are synonymous with a jail. And I would not want to use an I-1 uh, occupancy classification for a company restoration. We have um, facilities that um, provide pediatric transitional care services. Those are babies that are born addicted to drugs that are uh, being titrated off those drugs. It's synonymous with a pediatric nursing home. We would not want that to be an I-1. We would want that to be an I-2, synonymous with a nursing home, which is they're providing services to pediatrics. So I'm trying to get us out of this box of a one size or two size fits all. And I'd like us to be able to use all the occupancy classifications in addition to the R4. That's why I'm suggesting striking, Ron, the, uh, the last line, uh, the blue line that's under 308.2, because we don't need to qualify that they have to be an I1. That's just an option. I want the AHJs across the state to be able to use all options that make the most sense. I mean, I don't disagree. This is more by inclusion than than saying than requiring. Obviously, it says that, that shall include but may not be limited to. I I understand. I don't see. Um, I guess if we've got a group home and I've got a a, a licensed or a, a an architect wanting to understand what category a group home goes into, um, and these are all part of the base code alcohol and drug centers. I, I can basically identify alcohol and drug centers as being an RTF. So I could use that as the, as the, the definition that permits me to do an R4 or an I1. So I'm, I'm fine it, it, from simplicity point of view, clearly, you know, the more amendments, the more potential confusion. Right. That's no problem with me. Yeah, just take it out of there completely. But both in both sections, remove all reference to assisted, you know, remove references to the WAC. That's fine. Well, I think in 308.2, we would need to coordinate with DSHS, the licensing agency for assisted living facilities. We actually worked directly with DSHS previously, 
And and I we we propose this and got assisted living facilities under the group I one. That's where DSHS is comfortable. So I would only be willing to at this juncture without DSHS at the table, and and they have not been apprised of these changes. I'd only be willing to strike the high what what Dustin has highlighted right now, I'm, or recommend anyways. Yeah, it, it th that to me is a is superfluous to the overall point of the R4 uh, ability to use the R4. I I'm fine with that because that's a whack, as a reference to a whack, and and as we've had the discussion, I, there shouldn't be that uh, that crossover. So I'm even though perhaps assisted living facilities are still working under that framework, my, my goal in, in a lot of this or in all of this has to do with behavioral health facilities licensed as RTS. So that's the, that's the key provision. And, and I, I'm focusing more on what this adoption will mean under for those facilities more so than the assisted living. So I, I'm fine with, with the suggestion that that particular sentence be stricken as well as in the following section below under under the 310 just remove that amendment right there that's fine those can be taken out and again because uh, an alcohol and drug center by while there's no definition that's what a behavioral health center basically is is can be loosely uh, identified as I agree. And then if we can go to 308.2.6, uh, the, the, uh, the new language in red to say um, for assisted living facilities, that I think we need to remove that because I, I really hope that we stop talking about assisted living facilities and that we focus on just what your interest is and my interest, Ron, is to, to really focus on residential treatment facilities. So I would propose a friendly amendment to uh, remove the group R4 uh, without having DSHS at the table. It's really inappropriate to <laughs> not have the licensing agency uh, responsible for assisted living facilities. Um, I, I did check in with them. They were, they were, they were, they were not interested in pursuing this at all. So um, it would, it would take some education and opportunity. So I'm suggesting that, yeah, you, you strike that if that's okay with you, Ron? Well, what I, uh, and I want to, I know that there may be others comment, but I, what I would say is that um, I don't, again, it, it goes back to the same comment. Uh, assisted living facilities are a, a different animal in, in, as far as my own perspective and knowledge. And so I have no problem with with this, I don't know what this accommodation or or what the what the R four not having the R four would mean in relationship to an assisted living facility. So I I don't I, I'm focused on the behavioral health facilities which are RTFs. So um, I would uh, rely. Uh, my point was is that if you wanted to keep it open, I would just simply say R four or Group I, and then you've basically left the entire provision open the only thing you haven't permitted is an r3 well there's it's, no hmm. uh, other people have their hands up so i'm gonna stop talking no, that's okay i'll just um if we if we got a little bit of consensus let's get some feedback from roger and mike and then we'll throw it back to you roger yeah my question is related to what you're trying to do and then the reading of it so an rtf by by striking those two um, 10.5 and 3.2. Where does somebody, where does somebody given, where do they, if I'm designing an R2F, where do I go to figure out whether it's an R4 or an I1? You you can use the model codes. Yeah, and, and I agree. I, I, it basically the and it's later in the proposal that i i submitted i submitted code commentary that that den that discusses yeah. the difference I'm, between r4 and i uh sure. two and and basically this the summary statement in the beginning it says they're essentially the same except that one has smaller number of occupants or um you know one is designed for up to 16 and the other is for more so, so if i was an architect coming forward i i would basically be able um, to, to use 
the, the inclusive provision of alcohol and drug centers that is included in, in both and make the determination basically or predominantly based upon the size of the facility unless there are other issues uh, related to um, whether it's a voluntary or involuntary facility, which is a whole another topic. So you're saying with having alcohol and drug center that it, it's clear that it is in either 308.2 if it's more than 16 and 310.5 if it's between four and 15 or five and 16. With, without the language that just was, was proposed to be stricken, yes. I, okay. I, 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 Second question then related to 308.2.6. I don't have 2.5 and 2.7. I'm a little bit questioning why the licensed care facility, that's the title of it, but then it starts off with assisted living facilities. Are those congruent that the, that the header is licensed care facilities and then we're talking specifically about assisted living facilities? They're different Are, animals. Or should they do have different definitions? Then should the title be different? Or is does 308.2.6 apply to all of those listed? You know, the two, four, six, seven items that we have listed above. And it's listed that, that it's licensed, then I think that the first three words should be licensed care facilities as licensed by Washington under chapter. You're making a good point, uh, Roger, because licensed care facilities was added um, uh, after we amended the list of facilities under 308.2 and 310.5 as, as an attempt to clarify those two specific types of facilities. And, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm really after uh, eliminating a bunch of amendments is because we have a little, we have a great opportunity here to do some cleanup. I don't think the title makes any sense under 308.2.6 anymore. It really should just talk about assisted living facilities. And the, and the idea here was to clarify for designers that an, an, AL, an assisted living facility is a group I-1 condition two, because you know if you the I-1 has two conditions, one, condition one, and condition two. So I don't think that the, the, the title is important anymore. And if we wanted to clean that up, you could just remove the title and it could just read assisted living facilities are uh, licensed under the state. And then we list the WAC are, are classified as a group I-1 condition two. Okay. I, I certainly agree on if we're gonna go through the amendment, we'll clean it up. I'm not quite, and I'll let Micah maybe talk. He's more, he's the code writer, but um, I think that we should arrive at either the title should be assisted living facilities or I, I don't know that you, I think you want a title, <laughs> um, but I think that those two should be clear. <clears throat> they should line up. So Mike, I'll let you comment on that. I'm sure you've got other questions as well. And, and I Go ahead, Mike, I'm good to see you. Uh, sorry, I was gonna point out just in, in, in corollary to that, that the actual reference to the residential treatment facilities is a sub, a sub item where the paragraph indent so, so it, it it starts out, you know, the base the base paragraph is licensed care facilities, and then the residential treatment facility part of it is actually a sub paragraph. It's not listed in the same prominence. It's just a uh, vision semantics of how the paragraphs are put together. But okay, let's let's park that. Thank you, Ron. Um, Micah, why don't you tell us what we're looking at? I I really <laughs> I don't know, Todd. Uh, I just, I'm struggling with that change in 308.2.6. I'm actually struggling with some of the changes here. I, I think that Ron is right in this on 308.2 that you should be leaving the RTFs in there under that list as, you know, another option for the code officials to classify these as because they could be triggered as an I-1. And so you want to have them in there under that. You, you, you don't want it to be under R4 because then the I mean, these can only be R4s no matter what you do. And I don't think that's the case. I, I, and, and I don't want to put words in Ron's mouth, but I think that's what he's getting at. Mm -hmm. um, 
but then you know the the change in 308.2.6 either it's duplicative and not necessary or you just need to strike that entire section if you're adding it to an r4 i mean this is saying that those under that rcw or or WAC 388 are i1 condition 2 specific um now you're throwing that under r4 it, it's you know what's the reasoning there it, or is is that license that assisted living facility required to be more robust and that's why that specific language is in there because when you get into the i1 condition two you do get much more restrictive on the requirements or, or many more ad additive requirements and now you're saying oh that can be an r4 and all those requirements go away well, well well how are we justifying that so i don't think that addition of the group r4 under 308.2.6 is appropriate um i i think that's a problem again i have a lot of questions with this and and there's a lot of sections that need some analysis. Uh, I know that the folks in Seattle have done a lot of that analysis, but um, I think just you know going through this and going, oh, we could change it this way, change it that way without all the analysis that goes into it, I think is a big mistake. Again, just adding R4 to 302.308.2.6, I, I don't think it's capturing the, the needs or you know justifying why it's already required to be an I-1 condition two, which is much more robust than an R-4. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. I think you're raising some good points there. And I want to make sure that everyone feels welcome to comment here. So this is, we'll, we'll run this as an open meeting, all IFC TAG members and, and public, please uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to want to weigh in here. Um, okay, next steps, Al, Al or, or Ron, do you want to respond to? I, Those comments. I, if I jump, I again, I that we're we're focusing on the in this particular case, the the additional amendment that specifically identified licensed care facilities, and as as Al has indicated, the the preference is to uh, keep the provisions that limit the um, licensed care facility um, as the classification, the I-1 condition two. And I, I, I believe that's the case. And, and I don't see any problem with what I'm, I'm asking for in, in the proposal is that residential treatment facilities be stricken from this section completely um, and, and allowed to be uh, essentially uh, classified based upon the base model code. If you've got eight individuals um, that are receiving care, then you are an R4. If you have 28 individuals receiving care, then you're an I occupancy, um, presumably an I1 condition one or two. So uh, the model code takes care of that. So all I'm proposing in, in, in this is that as it's stricken there is that the, the reference to residential treatment centers be removed and I'm fine with the reference to group R4 or group I1 that, that pertains to licensed care facilities be stricken. I don't, that's not, that wasn't important to the, um, the overall, um, again, beginning goals uh, of adopting this um, for behavioral health facilities. Thank you, Ron. So just, just so I can understand, um, clarify what I think I heard is, was group r4 in 308.2.6 added or proposed by by you ron or was it proposed by it, it was proposed it was indeed it was proposed by 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 in my proposal um the only change to my proposal was i did not identify um license the 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 i had stricken the condition two from the um requirement just after that where it says group i condition two, I had I had basically left a sentence to say licensed by Washington State under chapter um, uh, 30A878A WAC shall be classified as group R4 or group I1 period. Oh, okay. And I, I, I didn't have the condition on there, but in reality, I don't mind in this under the discussion, it's fine deleting that that addition that I made, which is group R4 or 
and deleting the re removal of condition two and simply accepting the deletion of the of the reference to residential treatment facilities. That way we're not bothering, we're not uh, creating a, a new change upon stakeholders that haven't been participating in this process. This has been primarily focused on residential treatment facilities um, and, and not the facility. Okay, thank you, Ron. Let, let's hear from Mark and then Mike, I'm curious if that's addressing what you're, you're asking, Mark. Yeah, just uh, just a quick note. In, in my mind, it's kind of unique to have licensing requirements by a state in a code altogether. It's kind of unique. And I think uh, I think you would just assume that they are licensed and regulated by the state if they're that occupancy. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's kind of unique to have licensing requirements in the codes altogether. That's just my two cents. Yeah, interesting, Mark. Thank you, Micah. Thanks, Mark, for that question. I, it is unique, and I think it's important, though, because I, you know, other states I think miss out on some of things, or they get uh, provisions imposed on them that are not accurate because they are controlled by somebody else. But I guess my question is, if we're striking the last sentence of three hundred eight point two point six. Um, I think that's okay because I, you know, it's it's already at least code officials, in my opinion, would already assume that any facility, whether it's an RTF or any other building, could be classified as one or more occupancy types. So I, I don't know if that sentence is is you know really necessary because that's already a given. Um, the only thing that this is different though is is it doesn't use an occupancy type from the building code is this points to one or more occupancy types with a whack that's not controlled by the state building code act. So that may be the importance of having that sentence in there is it points to something that we as code officials are not enforcing based on what we are required or allowed to enforce. So, so that may be the importance of that sentence. And I guess, you know, I, I'm okay in the understanding that, yeah, we're going to classify it as one or more occupancies. We already know that as the building code. However, this points to those occupancies coming from something other than the building code. So again, I, I'm not quite sure, or, or maybe there's not an explanation, or maybe somebody can explain to me why we would remove that reference to the WAC rules and strictly provide an occupancy classification out of the building code when that was not the original intent. And that's why the WAC is pointed to in this or in this current code. Thanks. Okay, that's a good comment too. Um, so this is just getting good, but I'm uh, I'm going to step out and uh, hand the chair over to, to Roger, please. So good luck, everyone. Thanks, Tom. I will uh, step in on my first time ever running a meeting, but uh, Al, <laughs> your your hands up. So go ahead. Okay, thank you. I want I wanted to address both uh, Roger and Micah's comments. Um, so uh, the the last sentence of 308.2.6 was an attempt by DOH several years ago to we had proposed to the tag that hey the licensed residential treatment facilities have evolved significantly a one size fits all doesn't doesn't work and uh we proposed to identify uh by service category or services provided uh almost kind of a a line in the sand between voluntary and involuntary services um, that that we identify uh, several several buckets or occupancy classifications that would work. The tag didn't like that. They said, "Well, why don't you just develop the occupancy types that you that you'd like to see in your WAC?" And so that's the impetus for the language that you're seeing there. Is we said, "Okay, if you want us to develop occupancy types in our WAC, we'll do that." But as an agency, the Department of Health said, we really value the, the process and uh, yeah. you know what, what happens with the State Building Code Council. We don't want to start uh, creating building code requirements 
in our licensing chapter. So what we did was we, we got it in there. We were going to do it. And then we had a second thought. And we said, this is not a good idea. We're going to be responsible for maintaining that. It really belongs with the State Building Code Council. And so what we did in practice is uh, people would read that and they'd go to 246337 and they'd call me or somebody or one of my staff and say, well, I don't see any occupancy types here. And I'd say, you're right, but you see the section in this WAC that says you have to refer to the building code. So we're just going to use the entire building code. Uh, so this this is not useful, uh, to be quite frank. And it needs, this is a great opportunity to clean that out. And I think we're getting, again, that was a couple cycles ago or at least one cycle ago. And we weren't successful in, in working that through. So this is getting us closer to evolving the code in a way that um, and by, uh, that will work for RTFs. And, and, and Roger uh, made a good point too, is that, well, it's, it's nice for me to know what occupancy type to, to put these in. Uh, well, we tried that and it wasn't uh, previously and it wasn't well, except uh, it, it wasn't supported. So, um, this, what we're starting to work on now, I believe is the analysis that Mike is looking for as a group. We're kind of chewing through all this. this. There's a lot of history here, folks, and, and there's a great opportunity to kind of clean this up. And, um, the, the language, the last sentence of 308.2.6 is circular and doesn't help anybody. And to, to make a point for Roger, the reason that we started originally identifying licensed, uh, facilities in the state of Washington in the building code under a certain occupancy classification was for consistency across the entire state so that, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to convince a local ASJ, well, look, this is a pediatric transitional care RTF where they're titrating babies born on drugs off of, off of drugs. And that's synonymous with the nursing home. So it should be an I2. Um, it was, but as the model for RTFs has evolved, uh, it's exploded into um, all these different service categories. And I could probably really just draw a simple line, um, a simplistic line and just say uh, involuntary versus voluntary. That might not actually answer everybody's questions. But yeah, this this is a great opportunity to clean up some some stuff that we missed cleaning up during the, the last uh, cycle when we were working on 2021. I hope that helps. I'm I'm full agreement with that. In fact, I think that it, it appears as though I, I don't know if there's any other. This seems to be a I don't want to call it an easy one, but I, I think it we, we've got more stuff to look at. This this particular sentence is circular, and we've run into issues because it, it as Al just said, it what there's nothing in the WAC that identifies occupancy types. So oh, I see proposed striking the sentence residential treatment facilities. I see a note from Van saying coordinate with DS DSHS. Um, it's it's a working note. We, we can follow up on that. Right, right. Um, you've changed the title to assisted living facilities and in, in this conversation between everybody. So is it true that an assisted living facility needs to be an I-1? Is yes. that what I read and that's correct? Yes, and it needs to be an I-1 condition two. Okay. And the, the rationale behind that, Roger, is that condition two talks about individuals' capability to evacuate with uh, uh, either with limited or uh, uh, physical or verbal assistance. And we know from practice that, uh, oh, I'm going to be silly here, that most of the residents that live in... Uh, uh, licensed assisted living facilities aren't budding Olympic sprinters, right? So um, they they definitely need have some challenges with getting out of the building uh, on their own. And so, as a matter of fact, today we consider a Group I one condition to a staged evacuation, not a protect in place environment, but a staged evacuation uh, environment. So yes, condition two is important, and and this is what DSHS um, went to the State Building Code Council and advocated for and got on the book. So I don't think that the, the original rule proposal that Department of Health proposed, uh, the request for rulemaking that the Department of Health 
put forward had anything to do with assisted living facilities. So I'm saying that's not muddy the water by even talking about assisted living facilities. Mm -hmm. And that's get what would really help Washington move forward by cleaning up some of these amendments and helping RTFs. That's really the subject of yeah. what I believe that the, the original code proponent is, is suggesting. And, and we are too. We're in support of that too, the Department of Health. So Mike, I know your hands up. What I just wanted to do is kind of summarize everything that we're talking about with the proposed change of two, um, 308 and 310. So we're getting right now, we're striking 310.5 where it says R4 is not adopted and then if we go down can you page down Stian? um so we are not saying our, yes are are not included in this list of R4s and we're saying assisted living and and I'm curious what didn't we just talk about above that assisted living facilities had to be an I1 so why is it under the R4 list I'm suggesting we strike it. That's my friendly amendment. Yeah, that was a carryover from my uh, inclusion of 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 that particular sentence, or, or basically based on the size of the facility. And, okay. and I'm fine with Al's Al's comments, where we completely leave the the whole reference to assisted living facilities alone. And I'm I'm coming forth to say that. Uh, without the the last with striking the last sentence was only there because it was in the other provision now that i uh, someone coming to a to a local jurisdiction can can describe the facility as an alcohol and drug center th the same as a residential treatment facility they're just two different ways of saying the same thing okay so so, and we're actually talking about striking the assisted living facilities there under 310.5. Well, assisted living facilities is actually a base. That's part of the base code. Yes, so we are striking the, the addition. Yeah. Right, just the okay. addition to it. Except I'm confused because up above, we said that assisted living facilities had to be an I-1. So why is it listed I, under the R-4? You're right, because what's happened here is that under the base code, an assisted living facility could, in fact, be an R4. And what Alan is saying is that DSHS doesn't want assisted living facilities to be or, or has has championed for assisted living facilities to not be allowed to be R4. And, and so, yes, that it, it would be fine to, to delete that that entire line rather than just the the added portion of the line okay so i'm going to move over that's still an outstanding question in my mind but michael why don't you go ahead and offer your comments and questions yeah i was going to be back up at 308.2 um if you wouldn't mind going back up story and i don't think we would wrap those up and, and we're moving forward sure. um I, I don't necessarily agree with removing the residential treatment facilities from the I-1 as an option. Um, again, you're stating that no matter what, it's going to be an R-4 if you only have an R-4. But even that, we don't have an R-4 at this point. It's showing a strike through. So I am OK with the changes to 308.2.6. Thank you, Al, for explaining the reason for having that last sentence in there. Like I said, I had that question as, as why, and you answered it, and then you're saying it's not needed. Good, let's let's finally get rid of it, because like I said, code officials already know that any any use could be classified as multiple occupancy, so it's not, you know, it's not a it's not a pointer for the building code. It was a pointer to that whack, and if that whack is irrelevant, great, sentence can go. <laughs> um, but again, I don't agree with removing residential treatment facilities from group I, um, and moving them solely to R4. I don't think that's our intent here. I understand you want to use R4 as an option, but again, this is telling that it can only be an R4. Um, no, so I, I do think you should leave it under I and not strike it. And I'm not sure. The, the the, to uh, it. So, sorry, Mike, just to clarify, I, you know, following the conversation, I thought they will be deleted from R4 as well. Is it correct? And 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 uh, the determination is the number of of residents being served, not the the classification. And so in both cases, not more than sixteen is the R four. More than sixteen is the I one. And so by deleting the reference to residential treatment facilities, 
it, you can classify or you can characterize a residential treatment facility, particularly for behavioral health services, as being an alcohol and drug center. So it it, it works. You, it's the number of, of of persons receiving care that will ultimately determine whether or not it's an I one condition one or two or whether it's an R four. Yes, and I think I'm going to jump in. in. In my mind, after the conversation, we should either have them both in R4 and I1 or neither take them out of both. Agree. So that you're, it's very clear, it's very clear okay. that if it's between 5 and 16, it's an R4. And if it's more, it's an I1. Micah, your concern is, is that there may be times when a 12-person a, a, a may need to be an only one is that your concern right and, and i guess again we're, we're looking at changing the occupancy classifications as the first step out of the gate when we haven't provided analysis of actually going through everything that you get if you go to an r4 condition one compared to an i1 condition one or even an r4 condition two to an i1 condition two and, and so we may go hey that's not right. We, these may need to be an I, even if it's ten people. Um, and then, and then I would, and I'm sorry, Ron. I thought, did I hear you right that you would classify an alcohol and drug center as a mental health facility? Well, without the reference to residential treatment facilities, and if I come to, if I come to a, an official with a behavioral health facility, then behavioral health is by definition either drug. Uh, drug uh, abuse uh, treatment or mental health treatment. It's it's either of those two are combined under behavioral so, health. So would that be classified as a social rehabilitation facility? No, I'm I'm without <laughs> without the reference to residential treatment facilities. Okay. One of those two. Yeah. I mean these are very okay. broad categories that say shall include but aren't limited to. So they're very broad sure. very broad. Sure. So what you're hanging your hat on on this is just going to be the number of occupants or those served, and we would have to make a determination as whether or not that we are okay with an R4 being serving less than 16 folks and not having the additional robust items that an I1 condition 2 may receive. Well, it, it, but there are other conditions. For instance, the code stipulates that if you have secure or involuntary care for more than five individuals, you're you're immediately into an I occupancy and you it would preclude you from from using the R4. So that has to do more with with what Al just pointed out, voluntary versus involuntary. So there are a number of filters which would get you to the correct code classification, not just the number of individuals. The services provided and these particular summary of items, are very broad uh, descriptors. And, and my point is that residential treatment facilities uh, for the use uh, as being, because that includes weight loss centers, that includes all, but residential treatment facilities are very sure. broad. I'm basically saying that this summary of include but not limited to, it's fine to, to be left as is, and, and you don't need to add residential treatment facilities. But as Roger just indicated, sure. If you've got it in the I-1, it should be in the R-4. So either have it in both. Right, but, but I think a trigger you just indicated that I don't know as a code official is voluntary or involuntary. That's, that's not in the building code. And so you're saying that can be an important trigger on when things are no, it, provided it, for based on requirements of the building code. It is the, 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 the provision regarding um, whether or not you're an I or, or whether you, whether you're, you have a dominant occupancy group, obviously, and then you have uh, supplementary things, like if you have a small city hall that has a single jail cell, you don't make that entire building an I occupancy. The code says that, you, that the predominant occupancy is B. And, and there's a, a provision that up to five individuals can be restrained. And I don't wanna to get too far into the restraint. I just wanna point out that there are other filters that would get you to the correct occupancy other than just the number of occupants. And we're just dealing right now with the number of occupants based upon whether it would be an I or an R4, but then when you get to an, a, an issue where all eight individuals are actually you know, restrained, well, then that, that filter 
puts you back into the eye occupancy automatically. So the, the, the code has these filters in it already. We're just talking about the base first filter. You have the ability for a residential, for a, a behavioral health facility to actually be uh, an R4. And it can also be an I1. But then if there's something else that you're doing that makes it an I1, that, that part of it pushes it there. And there are other, other things that, you know, type of construction, there's all sorts of other filters that can push you toward the I1 versus the R4. But this is the base requirement that says that when you have, for instance, eight occupants that are receiving voluntary services, the filter almost completely puts you into the R4. And that's the point. Okay. Are you done for now? Oh, yeah, sorry, I'll lower my hand. Yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily agree, but that's fine. Okay, Al? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to qualify that um, I understand where Mike is coming from on this one because uh, yeah, I, I would be okay with leaving the in 310.5 and then up above uh, under the I-1, the, the listing for the RTF as well, um, but it would be incomplete. I don't want to signal to uh, uh, the building departments across the state that there's two choices. If, if we were to leave that here, I'd also want to include this language in the I-2, in the I-3, in the R-2, in the, uh, I mean, you know, we, we want to use all the appropriate, uh, we're trying to get out of a one size or two size, two occupancy classification choices fits all scenario, because that's not the way the, the legislature has developed all these service categories and it's across the board. This is a this is exactly the issue that we brought to the tag in when we were looking at the 2018, I believe, um, uh, cycle. And so what we're trying to do here is say we we've we do like the clarity of saying it would be nice if we could fit them in just two buckets, two occupancy classifications, but we can't. Uh, we have, like I, I was telling you, we also have licensed pediatric transitional care services that are a, basically a pediatric nursing home. That's an I-2. We also have competency restoration uh, that that is really a, synonymous with a jail. That's an I-3. So it's I, I like just taking it all out and, and just saying, I mean, unless we add this line, we can... If we keep this line for R4 and for I1, that's fine, but then we need to add it a lot more places. And I don't know if we do that, that that adds clarity, Micah. And so uh, it's got to be, we, we need more options than two. That's what I'm saying. The, the evolution of a licensed RTF is expanded to so many services that, um, you know, what we tried to do originally is say, if, is if you're providing these services, you have to be a fill in the fill in the blank occupancy type, but that just wasn't supported by the tag at the time. So we said it was supported that we could we could write the rules in our chapter, our licensing chapter two four six three three seven. That's that struck out here, but we just you know in retrospect we were like it's a bad idea for the Department of Health to regulate building code provisions in our licensing chapter. We don't want to. We do not want. We don't support that. We we believe that these provisions live and belong. Uh, in the building code. So that's why I'm suggesting we strike it out. Now, is it going to be clear? Uh, I don't know. It's going to take a lot of education, like RTFs always do, um, depending upon where you're at. I mean, Seattle has a lot more RTFs than, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, Shel yeah, Shehalis. Yeah. Sh Shelton, Shehalis. So every time we work with one of these um, uh, RTFs. It's it's uh, Ron and I usually spend considerable uh, time with the local AHJ explaining. Okay, these are the services. There's a differentiation between voluntary and involuntary, and then uh, uh, it's it's really hard for the building code to adequately address this without kind of being generic. And that's what I'm that's what I'm suggesting here. Um, and just to get to uh, uh, Roger's uh, question, how we're just by the way, Roger, when we struck out uh, under 
as proposed, uh, the as licensed by Washington State under Chapter 388.78a WAC. The reason for that is, is the generic building code has its own de definition for what assisted living facility is. Okay, and that doesn't necessarily match up with generically with those facilities that are licensed under 388.78a. So uh, we we have a conundrum there as well. So I'm I'm going to get to thank you. I, I still I still have a question or two, but let's Ken. Why don't you go ahead? As this might be a little bit off topic, but when we're talking about the number of persons more than or less than sixteen persons, are we using the licensing guidelines of what they're licensed for? Or are you actually using occupant load calculation for Chapter Ten? How is that determined? Chapter question. Yeah, it's it's Chapter Ten. Yeah, which is which is what? Oh, well, it's actually well. That's actually that's actually a bad answer, Ken. No, it's um, licensing. Give me a good one then. <laughs> okay, the, the better answer is it's the number of care recipients reserving services. So it's based on licensing. It's not based on Chapter 10. Uh, there you go. So, so licensing gets to determine the number, not the billing official. Well, the the building code does determine the number. The, the standard licensing is 16, and, and, and that is at least... And that has to do with Medicaid, Medicare provisions and federal reimbursement. And I mean, it, there's a huge amount of significance in the number 16. But that's that, that's a, not a licensing requirement. No, there's no isn't. limit on the number of care recipients but, in the licensing chapter. OK, right. but I, maybe that's not, I'm not getting the correct answer that I'm looking for. So who determines when the application comes into building permit what the occupant load is? When we submit uh, when we submit documents to local jurisdictions, we identify the number of beds and the number of individuals being served, and that is the provision that's used, not the square footage calculations or um, uh, any other provision. It has because there is a license involved, and the facility can't operate without the license. It the number of individuals directly being served, as Al just said, is the determining factor when we submit the documents. And, it, and as I said, when you, there's a huge difference in the ability to operate a facility when you have 16 versus 17. And, and that's why that number is so huge um, in relationship to just the operation, the ability to operate the facility is so different between 16 and 17. But that, you are, are you or are you not using the base code calculations to make that determination when you file your application? No, we're using the uh, the licensing provisions that identify the number of beds that can be, a uh, number of individuals that can be served based upon the operating license that's going to be used for the facility operations. All right, so my interpretation of this is, one, somebody wants to use the base code, but, and not have residential treatment facilities, but we still want to use the licensing as the governing factor in occupant load. And I just, I don't agree with that. So I'll, the I'll occupant load, the, yeah, Ken, the occupant load is determined by chapter 10 of the IBC. That's not what I heard. Well, right here in the sentence, you can see that it, it, it basically uh, indicates not more than 16 excluding staff uh, based on, you know, supervised residential environment and receive custodial care. So the 16 individuals are defined as receiving custodial care. But you're not using the square foot calculations in chapter 10. That's a, that's a, that is an add-on, uh, an extra layer that's, that's used to determine the means of egress sizing. Okay. So if, if I can clarify, the, the 16 is beds, and I agree with Ron. It says right there, excluding staff and 16 people that reside 24 on a 24 basis. For Ken's answer, though, for doing occupancy calculations for exiting, you still go back and do a square foot. Yeah, occupant load doesn't have, there's no, there's no, buildings don't have a maximum occupant load. Occupant load is used to determine the means of, to, to size the means of egress. 
and the number of required exits. There's that doesn't have anything to do with how many people you can have in a building. Um, I mean, there there certainly are, uh, uh, and we're getting a little off here uh, because yeah. we're really no, occupant load drives the mm -hmm. occupancy classifications also. I so, understand it's part of means of egress, but it also drives an occupancy classification based on occupant load. It's not just for exiting. So, and I don't know if that answers your question. And I do, again, this is my first time running one of these meetings. I do want us to make sure we're moving forward. And I think some of the, we are getting into the weeds a little bit. And I think that some of these questions will be discussed, I'm assuming later on as we get further down in the code. So, Hopefully we can kind of get an understanding and wrap up this base part. And then I believe as we get down farther in the code, we're going to get into more of the weeds anyway. So I'm that's my hope anyway. So Micah, do you have comments? Um, yeah, kind of, but I agree, Director. I know we need to move along some, but I, I would rather see the residential treatment facilities left in both the R4 and the I's as options um and again i i agree with you roger where it says above that assisted living facility shall be an i1 condition two and then under r4 we're allowing it to be an r4 that makes no sense um to me either it, it says you shall and then it says oh you can be less down here um if you're less than 16 i, I don't know if that's clear um that's all uh, and maybe that's what you need to modify in the sentence above if, if you're going that it's the number of people getting care, in other words, if it's greater than 16 people, then it's an I-1 condition too, if that's what I'm hearing that the folks want to, you know, you're, you're proposing to go to, then that's what you need to state in 308.2.6. Because right now you're saying it shall be. Yeah. It, uh, but yeah, I was just pointed out, he wanted to be able to use an I-2 or an I-3. And and I agree with him. You're you that if you put it into the provision that you're going to include it as part of the of either the I one or the R four, it it makes perfect sense to me sure. that you need to include it in also the I I two and I three. Yeah, and and I guess that's my question. I mean, if you have something that could be classified as an I three, you're saying if if it's got You'll never get there unless it's got more than 16 persons, correct? No, I'm saying that if I've got a, a, a but that's what your charging box. language states. No, if I've got you're only going to get an I occupancy if it's got more than 16 persons. In other words, you you can't you can't go down and go. I'm going to be an uh, an I one condition three if you don't get past the charging language of a group I. That's that's what I'm getting at here. Is is when you start making these changes, some of them, you, you may think it's actually beneficial, but again, for the code official, when we enforce something, I'm not going to jump to an I, I3 right out of the gate because of how the facility is managed or run. I'm going to look at, is this a group I? And the first thing that's going to determine that is, it says it's going to be more than 16 persons. If, if it's not more than 16 persons, it's not a group I. You won't even get to an I1 condition three. It won't matter. That's what I'm getting at. Is, is you have to look at how this is enforced, not how you assume it's enforced or assume it's written. It is written a certain way. You're scoping group I-1, period. No, I, You're so, scoping yeah. group I's. I agree fully. So, 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 yeah. So in other words, if we're, if we're trying to say something can be an R-4, but if it's less than 16 and it should be an I-3, you're never going to get there. That's the problem. I'll and, stop talking. Uh, there, we got to get to a whole. Start. And I agree fully. You're correct. Uh, and and that all basically stands to okay. more of the reasoning why those two those two sentences in each of them should just be removed. I agree. Which two sentences? The assisted living. No, the residential uh -huh. treatment facility added that those that sentence and and the one below. Um, you should you should take them out. Okay, take them out. I, I'm, I, I'm I'm understanding that on the residential treatment. I'm still confused on the assisted living because I I wonder if the whole section um, uh, three hundred eight point two point six should be gotten rid of. 
what's it doing for us? I mean, it says right now that any assisted living facility, so anything that's titled the assisted living facility is telling me has to be group one condition two. And you guys are telling me that there are cases where that is not true. No, that the, there's only one occupancy classification for assisted living facilities. That's I-1 condition two. And that's what's remaining here. That's why it doesn't make any sense for it to be in 310.5. And that's why it's being proposed to be struck out. Um, so the only thing that should, to, to move this forward to support RTFs, uh, and behavioral health and uh, mental health and substance use disorder facilities is to, to strike everything that you have here. Uh, it looks good. Um, because, uh, the, now if we want to leave that you can have an RTF as an I1 and you can have an RTF as an R4, that's fine, but I don't want that to be the only thing because I also want to use the I2, I want to use the I3, I want to use the R3, and so it it's 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 a really tough one here because I'm I'm trying to provide clarity to the building departments and building officials that are using this, but the the more the more language we use is then they're going to be like, well, which one should I use? And um, so I think I. You know, it's 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 a tough one because we we tried previously to identify it by service categories, and that we just weren't able to get that through. So this is okay. this is next opportunity to 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 really try and address a a challenging situation that we have. So I'm gonna Mark, I'm gonna call on you and let you comment, and then Micah. But then I I think we need to move on, and I don't know that we're voting on anything today anyway. So we can all sit back and digest these <laughs> changes and make sure we're don't have other questions that come up. So Mark, go ahead. You know, I, I think it's healthy for us to look at the overall review of these occupancies because it seems to me we're trying to integrate um, a licensing code and a building code um, and I think we need to keep in mind when the applicant comes in, it's not only being reviewed by the building department, but it's also being reviewed by the licensing department. And I see that a lot where the licensing department will have more rigid or stricter codes than the building codes have. And, and that's fine because in order for them to get their CFO, they're going to have to get approval from the licensing department. So I think it's kind of hard to try to integrate these two different review agencies into one code. And that's why I was saying that I think it's unique to have references to licensing in the body of a code. And, and, and further, I think one of the reasons we integrated to the I codes was to make it more universal throughout the, the whole United States. And so, the more that we specify uh, Washington in our code, uh, the less it integrates it to the rest of the United States. So that's what I see. Uh, and I and I think Mark, with the changes that we've gotten, we've gotten rid of licensed care comment in 308.2.6. If we take out the two comments, the the residential RPF lines in both of the 310.5 and 308.2. The only remaining reference to license as licensed by Washington State under um, for any WAC is the one up above for assisted living facilities, and that's why I'm still confused about that. But that's I think that that's fine. Um, so we are moving Mark away from eliminating the, the references to licensing, and it is it is purely. Um, number of beds excluding staff who reside on 24-hour basis in a supervised residential environment whether they're licensed or not is not relevant in that portion of the building code that's the way i read it anyway. so micah go ahead thanks i know we need to move on and that's kind of my thought as well i I have some struggles, of course, with this, and I do have some struggles with what Al talked about of having multiple types of occupancy classifications, R3s. I mean, when you compare a, a what is right now a, a I-1 condition one or I-1 condition two to an R3, 
it, I mean, they're so far apart. And yet I'm not hearing the justification as to why we should just go, oh, we'll do these as an R, even an R4 or, or you know, which could allow R3s in some instances. And I'm not hearing why. I mean, we're talking, we're talking story heights. We're talking area. We're talking sprinkler system, different sprinkler systems across the board um, to some extent. You're looking at, at, you know, the rooms, whether or not they're allowed to have locks or prohibited to have locks, your, your compartmentation of the structure. Uh, again, those are things we probably need to talk about before we get into change in the occupancy classification here in, in chapter three, because those are really much more important to determine if we're even going to move forward with this type of proposal without addressing those areas. Because, I mean, to hear we just want to eliminate this language and allow it to be, you know, whatever's determined by the the use of that structure based on the information we get from the applicant, I'm not sure that's actually going to help be more efficient for the applicant. I, I think that would cause more problems and more questions from the code official, um, especially based on the things we're not addressing yet, which may we may determine, hey, we're not getting, you know, there's no justification to be less robust than what we are currently. Which my other than it may be easier for the builder. I, we just we got we got a lot of stuff to figure out. I, I don't think we should uh, you know look at all these changes right here in chapter three yet. We need to move to the other chapters. Well, I I believe that you're correct, and that's where I think those are the details that I think we need to get into. And I will. I believe what I hear is the proposal is to go back to the base code as kind of our baseline. But then, Micah, there are those kinds of questions about you all know them a lot more than I do. Detailed questions about is this okay? If the base code says A, is that okay? And if not, do we need to make an adjustment? So, uh, or an amendment. So, I think that we should move on. And again, I think that this will be. The current markup is not approved, but it's the, the direction we are heading, given that we need to go through all of the other portions. So, Doyen, can you, um, I guess, page down? I think that is this all of the chapter three? Uh, so, we will clean up the language, we'll propose it for the next meeting in the way you see it right now. I have only uh, one question. Uh, uh, so we have 3826 assisted living facilities and we refer to a 388, uh, WAC 388. And right here, uh, we don't have the reference to WAC 388-78A, but we keep assistant living facilities. And what I heard, and I'm not the technical expert here, this is why I'm asking, what I heard was that Assisted living facilities are group I1 conditioned, condition two period. So my question is, you know, in order to have the document available for the next meeting, should we strike out assisted living facilities here or, or keep it and just strike out the initial proposal? Al, I'm going to let you answer that because I, I have a tendency to agree with Stoyan, but yeah. You're shaking your head, so you're on mute. Sound. I'm sorry. Thank you for the opportunity to explain that. So assisted living facilities have a unique definition in the building code, right? Uh, in Chapter 2, assisted living facilities are actually defined. Um, what we're trying to do here is, is one, qualify, and I think you heard this from the the from Ron that we're not interested in talking about assisted living facilities with this rule change moving forward. So we're trying to clean up any of that extraneous stuff that uh, might've got put in here. Um, and what we're saying is by qualifying it up above, because assisted living facilities can be something different as defined by the building code as what's licensed by DSHS under WAC 38878A. DSHS, has gone to the State Building Code Council and got this approved under 308.2.6 and wants this to remain. And by the way, they're not even at the table to even have this conversation. So there's a, there's a, there's a differentiation between what's licensed as an assisted living facility by DSHS under this specific 38878A WAC versus 
if you look at the definition of an assisted living facility, um, we don't want that to be, an, we, we would allow a generic assisted living facility as defined by the building code to be an R4. We're not proposing to change the model language, but we're trying to qualify. If you want to be licensed by DSHS as an assisted living facility under this licensing chapter, you have to be an I-1 condition too. That's the reason we're striking it from, from 310.5 and we're leaving it in 308.2.6. Okay, understood. Good definition. I'm wondering about why people would want to be licensed, but let's, let's pass on that for now. So let's go down. It looks like chapter four, which is now where we start getting into air separation walls, it looks like. Yeah, that first provision that was included under the WAC uh, definition is simply to uh, to match the uh, base um, the the base model code because the base model code includes uh, groups the groups indicated and R four, but the adoption under the WAC uh, 0420, uh, 51, 5420 doesn't doesn't include the R four because the R four wasn't adopted. So all it is is just a, a putting it back the way the base you know undoing the amendment. Right. And that's the same with down in item exception number three. You're adding that. No, no, no. Well, okay. that's a that's a okay. different provision because so, that. Al, really... you have your hand up. Is that still a leftover? No. Uh, yeah, but I, I mean, I'm, I want to be. I'm ready to talk about it all. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm not using the hand, unfortunately. But I'm, I'm. I'll lower my hand. Yeah. All right, Micah. Thanks. Uh, I think in 420.2, they're correct in just adding this back. Um, fire separation walls between sleeping units or, or through the through this area is required through each of those, no matter what. So I don't I don't see a problem with this one. But I do want to also point out that Al, you mentioned the definition of assisted living facilities. That is not a base code definition. That is a Washington definition. So I, I do want to point that out that that is not you know a base code something that we can fall back on. So if we do want to modify that definition, we can look at that to more clearly provide information because I do think it points to uh, WAC and other stuff. Oh, so I'll take I'll take RCWs a note of that. And WAC. Yeah, I'll, so I'll, so that I'll is a, a Washington that. language that includes a, an RCW number and a WAC number. He's Thanks. correct. Yeah. It is an amendment. Stoyan, I'm just going to ask you to go up on that um, where we got rid of the WAC on back up to 320, 310. Just put a note on the assisted living under 310.5 that we still need to, just a note on the side, we all need to confirm what happens when um, unlicensed living, assisted living facilities. That's what we're trying to, you know, just as a comment so that next meeting we know that we still need to go back and kind of confirm those questions. Put it on the parking lot. Okay, so now we get into exceptions of set area separation walls. Uh, I think I need to clarify the exceptions. So you okay. see the exceptions here, and we we kind of made a mistake when 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 we uh, filed the documents for uh, uh, 2021. Uh, International Building Code, because formally these sections, these exceptions, the first three exceptions, they don't exist in 2021. So uh, the council staff will uh, will file uh, a rule to clean up the language. The uh, section that was adopted uh, was uh, including the recommendation to adopt the model code. And the model code doesn't have these three exceptions. So if we eliminate the exceptions, then there is no need for this uh, uh, R4 to be added here. Well, so you're... it is it is in these three exceptions are a part of the 2018. They are They're part. Of, they are part of 2018 by mistake as well, because yeah. they they appeared in the first uh, printing. And then ICC uh, eliminated them, saying that they were 
added by mistake and the 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 council didn't follow up on that my printing doesn't yeah. happen yeah yeah there's a published errata on those al okay so you're saying that those three are not currently in the code they are not currently in the code and again uh the council staff is working on uh with uh expedite rulemaking we'll we'll clean it up okay it, so is there still the need on uh, item four and five to cross out number four and add number five? I think this was in the proposal uh, we received from uh, Ron, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to double yeah, check. That's correct. I mean, four and five, four was added as a, a placeholder to assist in the entire discussion that we're now having over the last four or five years. And, and so there was a provision or an accommodation made as a proposal through DOH that added uh, item four. And so with the cleanup, uh, the proposal was to remove it. But in fact, all these exceptions um, are, are gone, um, uh, are not part of the base code as it is anyway. So- Right. I agree. As a matter of fact, I'd say, I'd say, I'd say take uh, what, I'd say what was, I'd say, so four and five were band-aids that, that we, that we advocated for to help support the residential treatment facilities in the interim of having this conversation. Right. Yeah. And right. so I would say that we don't need, um, and I agree that I don't see any of these exceptions in the 2021, um, but uh, uh, I would say that we get rid of five too. Yeah, I'll, I think all of them were, were well, at least I know four and five were were established as a means to, to assist in the conversation, the same yes. conversation we're now having. That's correct. So they no longer would be applicable if there's an R4 occupancy available. I agree. Right. Micah, your comment? So... so yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, the group, I one, you're saying is now going to be an R four, and therefore this exception to provide the separations or um, this exception specifically for that. In other words, giving a break for group I ones, you're taking that away just because there's an R four. No, I'm taking it away because it's already explicitly defined in I one as it is already. I mean, I one there are separate provisions as far as section, you know, chap this chapter four twenty that relate to each of the occupancy groups and all of this information that's that that's here is already is already in the code under the i under the you know under i1 and and so it it's there already and and so the reason so in other words if i go into D there is no i there was no r4 and and so the reason it was added is we ran into facilities that were in this particular case um, it was only they only had put to five, but um, we ran into the need. Um, for instance, um, the, the the one big issue came up where we have facilities that are designed as pods where we have open sleeping arrangements, and that couldn't, that that couldn't be that couldn't work in under the way the code was written, and so it was modified to assist with just the way that facilities are operated in the state of Washington. And all of that stuff was 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 generated as placeholders uh, because we didn't have the R4. So what we're saying is these ex these exceptions, particularly exceptions four and five, were fixes later that would not be necessary now that you have the base code in place. Okay, Ken. So. I, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I, I stop. I, that doesn't. Sorry, it just doesn't make sense to me. When you're talking about when I go into section 420, which will now apply to R4s for separation walls, the walls shall be constructed as fire partitions in accordance with 708. Is the charging language of 420.2? There's an exception that gives you a break for Group I1s. It says sleeping areas arranged, blah, blah, blah. In other words, you didn't have to provide them as fire partitions. Now you're saying because we're putting them back in R4, 
customers, you have to provide them as fire partitions. That's what the charging language states. That's how that would be enforced. And, and there's, if there's other code officials on here that correct me if I'm wrong, that's how I would read the section. If you scroll up a little bit, uh, Stoyan, to the charging language, it says the wall shall be constructed as fire partitions. And that's an exception. Now you're taking away that exception. Now you're not going to get that break any longer. You're going to have to provide all these as fire partitions, even in that I-1 where you have the dedicated staff member. The, the, the issue, yes, it, I'm, there are provisions that preclude you from needing to do this if you've got the R occupancy. And so while you have 420 referring to all of them, in the end, when you go through it, if you have an R occupancy, you would you would not have the fire partitions under the I. There's an there's a complete summary of the fire partitions that are indeed required, and and in fact the reasoning or the whole purpose the the primary purpose for this is the, the fire partitions and the whole issue that has come up with smoke and fire dampers and everything else is that we're we we have facilities that have eight occupants that are are completely built with fire partitions all the way around. And so when you're an R, you don't, and I, I between now and, and our next meeting, I will, I will give you a, a summary decision tree that will identify why an R is not going to have the same level of fire partitions that an I-1 will have. And, and the I-1 is clear when you look at um, you know 420.7, there are specific conditions related to, to it. And I, I had a tree at some point, and I'll have that for, I promise to have that for the next meeting to show how, if you're an I, you don't have, um, you don't have the same, you have different provisions for an I than an R under 420. No, I, I agree with you. I'm just asking you, you want to remove that allowance for I's? No, I'm, I'm, re I'm not removing. What we're doing is we're basically going back to the base base model code and eliminating all the exceptions that aren't that don't exist anyway already we're, we're actually removing so, all so, of and i guess that's my question you're, you're you're making it more robust now because they have to be partitions for all eyes no matter what under Where before eyes, you yes. had an exception right under eyes yes but the whole point of this was that we have an r4 so theoretically a facility with eight with eight residents won't be an i it'll be an r and so I, I, I don't disagree with you. I'm stating that if it is an I, based on this language, you had an exception that allowed you to not provide those separation between the units in the I as fire partitions. You are now taking that away. So if you are an I, no matter what, if you remove that exception, no matter what, between in the I, everything has to be a fire partition. Doesn't That's matter correct. if it's an R four, not an I four. That's correct. Okay, so you're, so you're removing a break. Okay, yes. just clarifying that that's what you're going with. Yep. That's that. It, it's unusual for folks to remove a, a break for them on construction requirements. I absolutely <laughs> agree, but that that's an amendment by the state of Washington that that is acceptable to be removed because of the uh, potential option of having the R four. Just always painful when you rip off. Yes. A band aid, right? Yes. But, <laughs> so, the, but we're can, going back to the base model code. And <clears throat> so I yeah. under and, and obviously all the other state, every, you know, it has been reviewed that that fire partitions are important for facilities that have more than 16 occupants. And, and that's in the model base code. All right. I'm going to speak up now just because I want to get my two cents in. The, the last sentence in the charging, can you scroll back up? That state amendment buildings contain multiple sleeping units. Can that be identified as a state amendment? Since you, Ron, you're talking about going back to the well, base code. That's not in the base code, correct? Uh, give me a second. Yeah, go back. To correct. That. So I'd just like for the record that it would be identified that that's an existing state amendment. Yes, you're correct. Yeah, I didn't Thank catch you. that either. I apologize. So I guess, do you still want it? Yes, this particular issue that comes up is important, is another topic, yes. Because the 
the the the whole issue regarding sleeping units versus dwelling units is what actually drives the discussion and and so and what's happened now just for clarification is that if i have a, a 16 bed facility <clears throat> we now under the current interpretations that are being used every single room is a sleeping unit which means that the common area that's normally adjacent has to be treated as a corridor, even though it's an open area with furniture and everything else. So you have all of the fire construction requirements and fire partition requirements, even though um, under a dwelling unit, you're providing both bathrooms and kitchen and meals. You know, there's, a, there's an inconsistency that's related to this particular sentence that's been added. And so that is a whole nother topic that is very important to this discussion that is not in the model code. This can also I, this also I, impacts. Hang on, Al. Can I go back down? Can we resolve the exceptions? I think that everybody had agreement that we should get rid of all the exceptions. And yes, Micah, I think that that's, it is more restrictive in case if you were a type I before, but Ron is saying that if you follow then the base code, now you have to go to the base code to follow what you do as far as fire separation. I, I guess so, but again, these two exceptions are have nothing to do with R4. Yes, you can go be an R4, but these right. exceptions are specific to R2 I, and I1s, and you're, ta you're, you're taking those <laughs> away, and I just, I'm, I'm okay with that, I don't care. It just seems more robust when you're, you're looking at you know, yes, it's going to be an R4, and you're saying, oh, I won't require this in R4. I, I get that. But again, these aren't pertaining to R4. Right. The very last, the, the last sentence could have impact on the, I'm, I'm just looking at the okay. operation of facilities. The last sentence is, it could be equated to uh, the old style, um, basically homeless shelters. I mean, when you have just a whole bunch of people living in mattresses in the middle of the room. Now it's not, those are, that's a total, that's a transitional occupancy, not permanent and all that. But the, the last, the last addition there at the bottom had to do with the methodology currently in effect in the state where some facilities use low partitions and have all of the occupants in one big, large room rather than having individual sleeping rooms for each occupant. And so that's why, Al, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that's why that last paragraph was added as an exception to accommodate the way that facilities are currently operated in the state of Washington. Okay, I, I'm gonna call on Al, but Al, if you could answer for me, what's the difference between a sleeping room and a how, how is that different? The, so, a sleeping unit and a dwelling unit is defined in the building code and they, they have different attributes assigned to, to a sleeping unit versus a dwelling unit. This also, in addition to what Ron said, which is correct, it also has to do, this has some impact on dormitories as well, uh, where you have uh, a central common uh, areas and central kitchens. Uh, the, the idea isn't to qualify a, a dormitory as a single dwelling. And, and that's part of the, and I, we had, I just, uh, with the director at the city of Seattle had the same conversation and that there's a difference between the, the intent and it's in the building code commentary re regarding dormitories. And those are specifically referenced versus licensed facilities with, with 24 hour care. And, and, and so <laughs> we had this same conversation regarding when do you have a dwelling unit versus a, a uh, a sleeping unit situation, and I and I would say it, it is not resolved. And, and there are different different equal viewpoints on both sides, but they have a great effect upon how uh, where you have to put fire partitions or not. And and so if you have an R four with sixteen occupants, uh, eight anything above six, you know, ten occupants, and, and those residents all have access to 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 bathrooms and all and also uh meals prepared uh delivered on site so it's completely meets the definition of a dwelling unit there are inconsistencies in the state where 
code officials and, and even DOH still classifies the bedrooms as as sleeping units, not dwelling units, even though it does meet the definition um, because there's this ambiguity regarding college dormitories that's described. You know, that's a different situation, but it's also that's the one that's used in the building code. Okay. So that's why I'm saying that this sentence has a lot more to it th that would need to be discussed or, right. or resolved and, and would greatly assist in our taking this to jurisdictions because, as I said, different jurisdictions are defining sleeping unit and dwelling unit, um, which is which is actually the determining factor when you have an R occupancy as to whether or not you have fire partitions. Michael. I would argue that this whole sentence is misplaced in chapter four. The, it, the whole the sentence is determining classification. Well, that should be chapter three anyway. It doesn't, 420.2 is limited to separation walls. And there's already separation walls required between sleeping units, dwelling units, so forth. Um, you know, this, I, this could apply to a fire station as well that, that has, sleeping facilities. Bottom line is the whole sentence is saying, talking about classification, which doesn't belong in, in chapter four at all. That needs to be established in chapter three. So, you know, if, if, if not, then the sentence ought, ought to go away anyway. Can I, can I clarify, Stoyan, this is a current Washington State Amendment? Yes. Okay. Uh, you, you are asking about this, right? Yes. Yes, it is. So it would fall under uh, us cleaning up stuff if we were to change that. Yes. Okay, Michael. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know if we should get rid of this. I, I, I'm going to disagree with Michael Barth a little bit on this. You're not determining a dwelling unit in Chapter Three. You're determining an occupancy classification, um, which is not determining a dwelling unit or unit count or sleeping unit. That there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. Um, and I wouldn't say that would be only coming out of chapter three. Uh, there's lots of areas throughout the code where we talk about unit count or how to get unit count um, and, and determining unit count or what is a unit itself and clarifying information. This is clarifying information that may be very beneficial to these structures and it may not be beneficial to these structures, but it may provide clarification to the code official on when to, you know, require these separation walls and when not to that's part that, of the that's base code already. i think the sentence needs to stay uh, the base code already defines what a what an what a sleeping unit is there's a there's a but, definition and there's a definition for dwelling sure. this is turning around sure but of course right now what, 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 what i'm hearing what is you're saying? disagreeing with that definition or the interpretation of it um you said a moment ago that a dwelling unit is somewhere that has food delivered that is not a dwelling oh. unit I, I, I'm sorry, that was uh, just strain of thought as far as definition. Okay, and, and it, that's fine. But I, again, I, 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 I think some of these things are important to have and we need to justify why we're taking them out. I mean, we justified why they're in there. You're just saying that this may not provide anything other than, you know, some information, but that's sometimes a very good thing when you're looking for consistency of application of the code across the state. Well, this this directly refutes and 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 makes the definition in chapter two mute because you don't you're basically you're countermanding by putting this sentence in you are amending chapter two a chapter two definition without saying that you're you're immediately saying here that although dwelling units are defined one way in chapter two ignore that we're in this particular case. So I don't, yeah, and I don't necessarily agree with you on that based on it, it, is it saying that it shall be classified as a single dwelling? Dwelling is defined different than dwelling unit in the code. So again, we need to look at what we're talking about here. You're indicating dwelling unit and or sleeping unit, and that is not what this is indicating. So again, uh, I, I think we need to do some some very good analysis on this before we just remove it based on some general information, because I, so, I think the way it's being interpreted could be misconstrued. Ron and Mike, I'm going to try to get a little bit of control and make sure other people have the opportunity to speak. 
um, as, it, as it currently stands, right. that is a, the, the blue line in there in 420.2 is a wash, an approved Washington State Amendment. I don't believe that it was necessarily asked to be removed as part of this proposal. We could potentially consider it, but it is not, doesn't have to be on the table right now. So with that, Al, were you first, I think? I don't, I, to raise your hand. I'm not sure if I was or not. Okay. You are now. Okay, I'll go. This, I agree with Micah. This 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 sentence 420.2 is very important. Could you could uh, that that is in blue? That's a and you're right, Roger. This was not asked. This is not part of the code proposal, right. and um, it's very important. Can you imagine as a building official somebody submitting to you uh, 130 unit assisted living facility, and they say, "Well, we're just one dwelling unit." And so we don't have to have any separation walls in between our resident units at all. That's a problem. This is to clarify this, this, this is to clarify how you would apply the separation wall requirements. And, and Mike is correct about that. We need to keep this. This is important. I don't right. think it 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 changes the, the the definition of anything in in chapter two at all. This yeah. is this is a friendly pointer to the building people using the building codes. To, to help them understand how to differentiate the, the application of separation walls as it would apply to a sleeping unit versus a dwelling unit. And this is important. Okay, Michael? I, well, first I'd like to clarify, I, I wasn't necessarily saying that we should take this out of here. Obviously, you know, with because we do want the discussion and we want to look at all those. But what I was questioning is, you know, the that one sentence doesn't really eliminate any fire uh, partitions anyway. It's it's sleeping units have to be separated regardless. Well, it, it has not, you know what I'm all I'm suggesting is the sentence doesn't really change anything. I'm all for adding clarity and and things of that nature, but you know, but it but it doesn't change the un, the the okay. technical requirement of the separation walls. Mm -mm. Okay, and then uh, Quinn Tai, you had your hand up before and you brought it down. I want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to speak. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I wasn't going to, I was going to bring it up and I was like, maybe it's not important, but I kind of agree with both Micah and Mike Barth. Um, I think this sentence probably would sound better if it was in chapter two, because you're really, what, what you're trying to do is you're defining a dwelling unit. And I think it would properly be placed in chapter two more than anything, not chapter three, like Micah said, but also I, I kind of see it could potentially stay here, but at the same time, I could also see that it could be in chapter two. Okay. I agree. I, I think that, and, and if I can just point out that, that there is a huge difference. If you have an eight person residential treatment facility, and you and you are required because of this provision to use sleeping units rather than dwelling unit. You are adding fire partitions throughout for an eight for an eight uh, for an eight unit facility, and and so this this sentence specifically does have a huge effect by virtue of the classification. Um, the R four doesn't matter anymore because you've turned around and added all the fire partitions that the R four says you don't need when you only have 16 individuals. So there is a huge implication with this definition. And and I and I agree perfectly. Put it back in our put it back in in section two where the definitions are. Don't put it here because there's nothing in section two that tells you that this exists. I so I bomb um, sorry, and that's exactly what I was going to say is let's can have further discussion. It sounds like people think it's a it's good to have whether it should stay here or move if they question to be um, discussed. So, Micah, do you have? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, and in, in Marana, if you want to just send me a side chat, can you tell me where you're saying that the R four gets you out of unit separation walls or the separation because of the classification? It says, dwelling unit 
the dwelling unit. Uh -huh. then, I, then it says here that, that fire separation walls are required separating dwelling or sleeping units. If I have a dwelling unit, I don't have to have fire separation walls between all the individual bedrooms because the entire unit is a unit and that unit has to be separated from other units. If I have a separate sleeping unit, then okay. each bedroom has to be separated. Okay, well, so what you're getting at is removing this sentence will remove, again, we will be going backwards, be less robust in our separation. Correct. Or eight or 10 okay. units or, or even 16 units, right? Up to 16 units. Right, that's what the be model without code separation. Allows. Yeah, the model code. Uh, again, the, but that doesn't mean the model code is right. Yeah. I think, which Mike, I think that that kind of comes to, I was not here when the R4 got taken out, but if we're allowing R4 again, are we going for 16 beds? Is that less restrictive than what we currently have? Okay with uh, that? Absolutely. And that, this is a huge point right here. Yeah. Because this states that you, you can't have 16 units without separation. And if you just go straight R4 base code, it will allow 16 units without separation. Okay, and what, I'm, I'm not sure that's the way we want to go. That's exactly so I, I, I would say don't right. remove this sentence. It's right. plus minus. And, and this, is a, this is the key provision because those fire separations are what are costing these facilities up to 25% more to build. Okay. And, and so that's the reason we're here. Is I understand that, but I think we're getting to this argument on all these ones. I mean, this, this is the second item to come up. You know, we're going to be discussing this on, on the, uh, the, child, the family home child care. Yes, we have an issue and yes, there's a need, but do we go and lower the standards, go backwards in our, in our, in our, our risk mitigation just because there's a need? I, I don't, as me personally, I don't agree with that. So for me, I would like to leave this sentence. And again, if folks vote me, overvote me, that's fine. I'm not a member of the right. tag. I'm just here participating, but I think that's a bad precedent. Okay, can I, so we aren't gonna be voting today anyway, and I would like to jump down, we've got 10 minutes left um, to 420.3 horizontal separation. Um, so we at least talk about everything in chapter three and four today, knowing that we will have to come back and confirm. And so, um, the only change that you've made is to add R4 back into the exception. Stoyan, correct? Stoyan, I believe the, that these exceptions that are listed for 420.3 are, are actually the same issue. They're not. Yeah, the same issue. We don't need the amendment here. Uh, this uh, exception will be uh, eliminated again with. Uh, uh, Updating the code of the current. Yes. Okay. So we we don't we don't we don't need it here. Yes, it, and I'm I'm fully agreement that yeah that this was a this is as we same issue. Okay. Do we want to get down to chapter ten controlled egress doors or? Well, and the and I want to point out that that Al and I have had a, a bit of a discussion about. That, that provision and, and the reasoning behind why I included it within the proposal was because there was a significant amount of discussion regarding that that created the amendment that's currently in place. And I was offering for that same, the, the same conditions that were in place for an I-1 condition two to be transferred over and, and used in the, in the condition of an R-4. And, and the reasoning is, is that there are, some facilities that are hybrid currently in, in the state, although fewer now than, than there were, where you would have a seclusion room, for instance, in a behavioral health facility where there would be a, a single room where, where restraint would be involved. And, and there's an entire WAC regarding, uh, there's a number of provisions within the WAC regarding the operation of that, that room and, and the fact that it has to be you know, 24 hour watch and, and, and all the other safety concerns that related to it. Um, but it does bring up a, an issue over when can you do that? Um, and also a number of these facilities um, that are more on the involuntary end are, are complete. I mean, they are, as Al pointed out, they're just like jails. I mean, we have one that we just did that's, that's 100 yards away from the entrance to a the jail in Thurston County. And the reason is, is it's jail diversion. 
and, and so we have offices within the facility for the prosecutor. And so it, it is much different than, than a facility across town um, that would basically be serving, you know, weight loss individuals trying to, to, to a 24 hour facility for weight loss. Right now they're under the same code there. Okay. And so anyway, I'm, I'm jumping to a little further, but this, this provision, what, I, what Alan and I had the conversation about was if there is hesitancy or, or if this provision is, is creating, uh, by adding the R4 creates complications to this entire adoption process, I don't believe I, that I would, uh, I would be certain to allow the base model code to, to be the one to govern this and, and not, not add the R4. So I'm, I'm offering that this one be removed if there's opposition to it. And I, my understanding is there is. My question is, is, is there, is it all R4? There you're asking, but Al, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, we would, the Department of Health would not support adding the R4 to controlled egress doors. Now the base model code provides an opportunity for R4s to use delayed egress, mm -hmm. which, which controls the ability to, uh, well, there's an alarm that goes off and there's a delay in, in, in opening the door itself, but it doesn't actually prevent occupants from leaving. So we would still consider that a voluntary setting. Um, it just slows the occupant down from, and it also alerts staff that there, there's a potential elopement or somebody might be uh, leaving without, uh, against medical advice. I don't know. Um, but uh, regardless, um, we're not going to, the Department of Health is not going to be supportive of use of the R4 occupancy for involuntary settings, uh, just like the setting that Ron was describing in, in downtown Tumwater, I think it is, or something like that. Um, the R4 is going to be perfect for the, the lower risk um, facilities that are voluntary. But when we talk about things like 90 to 180 day civil commitments, where people are committed to treatment by a judge um, or a desi county designated mental health professional or something of that matter, um, that's not a good fit for an R4. R4s are going to be, for lack of a better term, sort of the vanilla, lower risk um, because, uh, because I I hear what Mike is saying, we're 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 not willing to take all the mitigations away from the higher risk RTFs. We that that would be completely irresponsible, um, or unresponsible. And uh, uh, so yeah, we would we would support the model code, the base code, allowing for delayed egress in in an, in an R4, which we don't have to make any changes, but to add this these controlled egress doors to an R4, we're, we would not support this. Okay. So is there any other strong recommendation to keep it? Uh, Micah? Yeah, I, I agree with Al on this one. Uh, this would be an addition anyway. This is not in the base 2021 at all. So, uh, so you know, R4, this would be kind of a giveaway for controlled egress that, that would you know, is not a, you know, we're talking about national level code changes. This is not there. And, and as I, yeah, I pointed out that that's, I only added this because this has already been carefully dissected and identified as a means for uh, corresponding to the way facilities operate in the state of Washington with the, with, at the time period, this has created all these facilities where I one condition two by a matter of course. And all I was doing was now that if the R4 is adopted, I was I was in, allowing for the R4 to be part of the same group since the code states that the only difference between the two is the number of occupants. But I am, again, this was only for consistency in my mind, which I can see might not be consistent for others. And I'm happy to just not, not have this muck up the R4 adoption. I, okay. I would not, uh, not even be there. All right, so we will take that out. And with that, we've got two minutes left. Um, do we need to talk about the blue or the blue were already? No, the blue, the blue is already there. We don't, yeah. we don't need to talk about it. And uh, there are 
a few right here that I'll, I'll, I'll clean up. So for example, this, yeah. this is a, a, a existing commandment. And, you know, if we are adding R4, it's a, this is a model code. So I will, I will delete uh, this table. Uh, and there are a few others like that. Yeah. But uh, for the next meeting, which will be next Wednesday, the same time, I will clean up the document. I'll post it on the website. And I will have this document with, uh, uh, you know, the track changes available. Uh, so for the technical advisory group members and the public, you can identify uh, the difference. Okay. Sorry, and I actually would, would like you to keep this table in there. This is one of those that comes back to, we would be going backwards in our robust nature here in Washington. Because right now, if you're an I, you're, you're looking at a higher fire resistance rating. Now, if we're going to go back to an R4, you're going to have a lower fire resistance rating. Again, some of the things that we have done, we would we would be taking away and, and lowering our requirements. So I, I think the things that where we would be technically lowering our requirements, we should include in the documentation for discussion. So I would, I would yeah. rather you keep this in there just for discussion purposes. Thanks. Okay. Quinn? Yeah, I don't. Uh, this one is just more of a, I guess, open topic. Uh, I don't have any feelings one way or another. But going back to the um, controlled egress, uh, maybe instead of saying R four, I understand what Ron is saying about there's certain occupancies that might maybe need it. So maybe instead of saying that, just say Group I one and I two, and whatever the occupancy is that you're trying to control. You know, like the the involuntary. Um, occupancy type. So maybe spe specify something that's more specific rather than make it a general R4. It's just a thought, food for thought. Okay. All right. With that, I believe that we are going to close the meeting. Again, being the first time I've run a meeting, is there anything official I need to do so in or just say we're done? <laughs> we're adjourned. Okay. We're adjourned. We'll see everybody next week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.